My name is Michael Don Smith. And my name is Michael De Groot. And together, we are bringing you the story of a speech podcast. I just thought I'd talk to you about the fact that this event is sponsored by the two Michaels, as you heard in the introduction. Well, this Michael is also affectionately known as the signature speech coach. And that's what I do. I work with people to develop the DNA of every speech they will have to give. And as you'll know, if you follow our podcasts, and I'm sure you will be following them because they're getting some good reviews, that we're deconstructing the art of speech making to make it more professional, more polished, and more powerful in delivering your message. And we do that by taking small speeches, five minutes or less, and showing how much you can pack in to a signature speech, an elevator pitch, or a short delivery. So that's what I do. And before I hand over to the mic, I'd just like to say that if you Google Michael Don Smith or search for me on Eventbrite, you'll get the information on my latest events, trainings, or wherever I'm appearing. So Michael Don Smith, put that into Google and you'll find out what I'm doing. There'll also be a link below to my next event, which is on Eventbrite. And the thing to remember is if you put in the code NETWORKER, you will get a 50% discount. So that's me. Let me hand over to my co-sponsor, the other Michael. Ha <laughs> ha! Thank you so much. And this Michael, <laughs> who sponsors the other half of the podcast, um, is affectionately known as the storyteller. So what we do in my company called Staying Alive UK, we deliver a number of products and services to help individuals and companies grow their business reputation, their sales and customer loyalty through the medium of storytelling. Now, we do this in a number of ways through creating animations, to create story animations, really. And we also deliver storytelling workshops and education. As well, of course, I do another podcast. And that's also called Share Your Story. So anyway, you can find me and everything that we do via stayingaliveuk.com and just follow the menu link on that website, which is called Share Your Story, where you will see the workshops that we're running in the centre of Birmingham. And like the other Michael, I'm also offering a nice discount, 50%. If you use the code SYS50, that's Sierra Yazoo Sierra 50. And if you put that in like a coupon code on the online booking form, you get a 50% discount. So during our last episode, where we reviewed the V4 Vendetta speech um, in, in incredible detail, we or rather, Michael Don um, started to talk about rhetorical devices. I can't even spell the word rhetorical. I can now because I've looked it up. But it certainly fascinates me as a storyteller how probably I'm using this already in storytelling, but didn't know what it meant. Um, and it's definitely a new topic for me. And so what we decided in this episode that we would delve into rhetorical devices. Now, there are hundreds of them, so there is no way we're going to be able to cover all of them. Um, and therefore, we're going to be including some links in the show notes, uh, which you can click through to, and you can have a look and read all of them if you'd like to, and click through and, and get the, all of the explanation. But I'm going to hand this over to Michael Don because he's the expert, the master in this, and he's going to pick a few and get us to, to have a look at this. And he's going to, I'm sure, challenge me whether I've used this in storytelling or not. So I'm going to share perhaps some little bits of stuff that I might remember or, or know about. But in essence, Michael Don, it's over to you. OK, well, a couple of challenges there. I'm, I'm definitely going to be looking for a lot of examples 
from Michael because I've heard you speak <laughs> and you are a master storyteller. So all we're doing is showing you, making visible some of the skills that you, you, you know. So you've been a little bit too modest there. And always remember, if somebody says they're an expert, expert is made up of two words, X and spurt. <laughs> and X is a has-been and spurt is a drip under pressure. So I, I don't, I'm not an expert. <laughs> but, okay. but yeah, I do, I do love the, um, the art of uh, speaking. And it is an art. Before we had the Gutenberg Press and the internet and speakers and television and radio, way, way back before everybody had access to the library of linguistic magic that we have nowadays, then to be a great speaker was held at the same level as being a great artist. A Michelangelo, um, a Da Vinci, these great artists of painting and sculpture and the great scientists and the great thinkers. In the ancient days, the rhetorician or the speaker was held at the same level. Now you might say, wow, there's not that much to, to speaking. But if you look, just glance down the list and the, the link will be in the, in the notes. The glossary of rhetorical terms on Wikipedia just goes on and on. It's, a, it's an absolute deluge of ways you can do that. So there's two things I need to, to co create context is that rhetoric is different to logic, although some of the logical techniques are captured in rhetoric. The point of rhetoric is really just to get your point across, to make your meaning and your purpose known so that you can convince people. And you almost hit them over the head with rhetoric. That's why people will say that's a rhetorical argument or a rhetorical question. A rhetorical question is a question that you ask when you're actually just stating a fact. So get that one. Rhetoric is the skill of imposing your conclusion on the audience. That's why in a courtroom, the lawyer is making rhetorical arguments because he, has, he wants his client to win. If you're having a discussion or a discourse to discover something, that's a different conversation. So the public or professional speaker is a rhetorician because he's usually being paid, that makes him a professional, to get his point across. Any thoughts on what rhetoric means to the amateur or the professional, Michael? <laughs> Um, I'm just reading it here, and it says, um, rhetoric is the art of persuasion. Um, yeah. Full stop. <laughs> and it aims to study the capacities of writers or speakers needed to inform, persuade, or motivate particular audiences in specific situations. So, yeah, it makes sense to me now. And you're right, when I help my clients in their storytelling uh, activities, that's what I'm helping them to do when they write a story. There has to be an element of informing them, persuading them, or, and then motivating them to do something. Um, so it's interesting you mentioned the, the lawyer in a... In a courtroom and see when when I think about rhetoric because obviously I've heard the word before but I could never articulate really what it means um, I couldn't even really spell it as a Dutchman it's not a word that I was that familiar with although I've you know I've mastered speaking English for a very long time and learnt it from a very young age in the Netherlands because you have to as you know it's a it's a compulsory language you must learn at school because English is spoken 
throughout the world and therefore and Dutch isn't apart from a few old kind of colonies ex colonies I should say anyway back on onto rhetoric yeah but, I, but I felt a, it was I felt it was so for me it was like um being argumentative trying to get your point across uh that's what I thought it was well well this this I want to jump in there because it's a very good point because there is a there's a sort of cockiness there's a uh an arrogance of mm. people who claim to be rhetoricians that has made the quote unquote ordinary speaker think they've got to be they've got to dumb it down they've got to smooth it out you've got to use simple words but rhetoric is about persuading it's not about being um complicated and one of the things again i get my clients to do which is a lot of fun i get them to memorize nursery rhymes or memorize things because um let me give you an example this is a terrible tale of paul mcgregor james de cuthbert hall he worked with james at ship, as shipping clerk at parkinson mcbain and burke who at their store on north broadway sold dry goods in a retail way upon this day a curse to fate mcgregor james arriving late dashed headlong madly toward the store and plunged in through the spinning door uh, and i could go on <laughs> but now that's just a it's a poem it's a you know a funny poem but if you look at it it's been constructed with certain rhetorical devices it starts off saying this t is the terrible tale tt of paul this is the terrible tale of paul and that alliteration creates the rhythm then the rhyme which is a a, a rhetorical device terrible tale of paul mcgregor james de cuthbert hall so you've got the rhyme there. who at their store on north broadway sold dry goods in a retail way now that's a rhetorical device so they sold dry goods in a retail way so dry they sold as at the front and they sold at the end in a so it's a retail store yeah but it's made it more engaging and more powerful so one of the things i would ex- ask people to do after this podcast we always give you homework is when you're listening to people start listening for the the main device so if you ask me what we talk about device off the top of my head i would say alliteration that's using the same letter in front of words um right. rhyme is is a is a form of alliteration which isn't used um although Donald Trump did use it in a speech where he used a rhyme and Donald Trump used a lot of rhetoric he creates word pictures which are argument ad hominem and when you look through the list is fourth on the list and that's where he doesn't argue the facts he argues about the character like um Nancy Pelosi calls a so so Pelosi or not but he, he he creates a character or an attribute of the person and makes it seem like if that sleepy or someone else he called sleepy and that's got nothing to do with the person's ability or their politics but it's negative and the human mind just creates that link that person if his name is Floyd we call him sleepy floyd hmm. and that's linked and in the courtroom the the judge would the opposite uh, 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 or the opposition um, or uh, that's a uh, argument the, 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 the council's been argumentative so he's making arguments that are not logical yeah so should we dive into a few of these here I so have a question yeah would the ex speaker of the house of commons in the united kingdom john burko is he a good example of using rhetoric Well, wow, it's a very good question. I would say he's not a good example. Right. And the reason he doesn't have to use rhetoric is that he has he actually has the power to command. So you rhetoric becomes more and more useful the less power you have. So in business a project manager has to use a lot of rhetoric because he often has people working for him. who aren't paid for him who aren't they he's not their boss right so i was in telecommunications well you know in a technical you may have a project manager who's got five or six subject matter experts or five or six departments and he's got to lead the project but he doesn't actually run the different departments right 
Whereas John Burko, he's literally got order, order, which is basically shouting out a word because he's, he has the power. Right. Now, where he does his rhetoric is when he's um, making his little asides. Yes. Which again, that's what I mean. Would, yeah. So they are, they, are, they are rhetorical devices, right. but he's using them. He, actually, he's, he's, again, it's humor. He's trying to make, because he has the power to literally close down the parliament if he wants to, mm. he doesn't want to resort to his power. So he uses rhetoric, but he doesn't have to be very good at it because he's the one, he's the speaker of the house. No, okay. He's the voice of the house. So in, in the end of the day, he can just tell him to shut up. I understand, yes. Now, a, a speaker for historic. A historical speaker was very good, Bethy Boothroyd, because she's a woman and she she had this power. But when a woman exercises power, it's very easy to say that she's a B I T C H. You know, it's hard for women to exercise power, mm. even if they have it, because again, it's associated with their their sex, not with their ability. Mm. So she had to be very clever. So she was a very good rhetorician. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. you okay. Know, so let's. Let's 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 play this game. Let's think of a rhetorical device that we know of that we we use ourselves and we get it. Ones that we we've seen other people use really well. And the third category is rhetorical devices that we want to use. And again, I pass that over to the listener to think about that. After this short podcast, have a look through the glossary, look at the terms, and say, "Oh, I, I do. Use, I now I get it. I use that one." Mm. Um, and then there'll be others you think, oh, I, I like that one. I'm going to use that. And the, the, sorry, that was three. Number two is when you hear people um, try and spot some of the devices they're using. And there are a lot of them. There are a lot of them. <laughs> so did you, have you spot any that you use? That I, you recognize no, use? I just, I just, sorry. I just, a bit of humor here. I just, <laughs> I saw um, oxymoron. It's <laughs> seen on the list. <laughs> An oxymoron creates a two-word paradox, such as near miss or seriously funny. An oxymoron is sometimes called a contradiction in terms, and is most often used for dramatic effect. Um, yeah, I've I know the word oxymoron, but I guess I've. I never thought it was related to this. Uh, I didn't know it was rhetoric. I didn't. I thought it was like making fun of somebody. Um, I have used. I have heard it used in relation to people going, "Oh, that's an oxymoron you you've just said, or you're using." Um, but I couldn't. I couldn't. Well, go well, you can, well, okay, oxymoron's a good. One. That's that's a good one to spot. So if you want to, so, so the, the, and they're fun. The ones that I like, there's ones that call military intelligence. And right. Of course, that's not meant to be an oxymoron, but if you spot one, you can pick it up. So when people say, hmm, I've just had this letter from military intelligence. I'm not going to open it because that's a clear oxymoron. Military and, in, and military and intelligence in the same sentence. That just doesn't work. Right. Have you heard that? No, you heard that? no, never heard that. Oh, that's no. what so military intelligence is. A, is where you can spot them. Um, there is one that says that. Uh, I'm trying to think of some. I, I know some rude ones, but so trying to think of rude. <laughs> <laughs> now let's keep this clean. Oh, this podcast. But, but the people do things like um, it, the a snail's pace is an oxymoron. Why yeah. though? So, Why? I mean, that's perfectly normal. <laughs> no, because you, because what you do is you go. We're never going to get there at this snail's pace. So basically, you want people to move quickly, mm. but you illustrate how you illustrate the fact. Then they might think they're moving quickly, but you can use an oxymoron to demonstrate. So oh, I got it as quickly as I could. Oh, you're obviously moving at snail's pace, then, were you? Right. Right. Okay. Um, so anything that you can make, so um, her the warmth of her ice. People say something that she she greeted him with an icy warmth. Mm, okay, I get that. 
Yeah. 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 Um, Okay, so it's some as it says, it's a contradiction in terms, like a two word, two word phrase that contradict each other. That you can yeah. use for to to make a you can use to make it um, for dramatic effect. It's saying so yeah, to, get, to emphasize the point right. and and to to be sarcastic, really. Just you know, oh, I'm so pleased to see you. Yeah, you're so pleased. I can, I'm done. The others, in fact, the person is really good. It was if you listen, um, Winston Churchill just came to me. You know, so uh, this is oxymoronic. So I think the famous one is is it Lady? There's one lady in the House of Lords, or House of Commons, was arguing. Said, said um, Mister Mister um, Mister Churchill, you are drunk. And he said, Madam, I am indeed drunk, but you are ugly. And in the morning, however, I will be sober. <laughs> Does that make any sense? Did no, you catch that? No, I don't. <laughs> Sorry, right, I'm say, challenging you now. One. There will be other yeah. listeners who didn't make sense to either. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so no, no. That's good. So, so here's what he's doing. She's called. She's saying to him, "He's, he's in the House of Commons and he's drunk. Mm. You're not supposed to do that. That's bad. You know, it's a really bad thing." Yes. So he's drunk, and she's she's going to call him out, but because he's Churchill, nobody ever says it. No. But she has the audacity to say, "Mr. Churchill, you know, you're in the House of Commons and you're obviously clearly drunk." Mm. And then he just flips. He contradicts against him. So he, he says very subtly, "He goes, indeed, I am. I am drunk." But you, madam, are ugly. But in the morning, I will be sober. <laughs> so what's we saying? In the morning, she'll still be ugly. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Get it. Yeah. Get it. Not now. quite an oxymoron. But I was yeah. thinking, but this is that's a rhetorical. Yes. So, so it's got nothing to do with him being drunk. He's not. He's not. He's not. Um, it's argument ad hominem, actually. I really. So he he deflects it with the rhetorical device by attacking her on that level. So, yeah, that was definitely an argument ad hominem. But, like, Churchill's got – I mean, Churchill's a great rhetorician. Is he? Right. Well, let me dig myself out of that hole. Let's go to a – in fact, that was a non-sequitur is what I did there. A statement bearing no relationship to the preceding context. Right. So that was a non-sequitur. A non-what? Say that again slowly. A non <laughs> A non sequitur. So it's, it's, if you go down the list, it's second at the end. So a non sequitur. It literally means it doesn't follow. Right. So her argument was you're drunk. He ignores that and then makes an argument about the fact that she's ugly. And then so it's out of context, but he cleverly brings it into context. It makes it sound. So in court, they would say, um, leading the way. You know, it just doesn't, it's no, it doesn't. You're still drunk. He hasn't argued. He hasn't defended himself. He hasn't said anything mm. about drunk mm. drunkenness. He just attacked her for being ugly. Right, right. So it's another. But what happens in these devices? You make it. You, you make it sound like it should make sense. Mm. These, are, these, a lot of these are, are, are well, they're persuasion. So you, you they're rhetoric. That's what I say. It's a rhetorical question. But it's also it's, it's a deflecting it away from you and putting it back onto the other person. So um, yeah, unfairly and out of context. Actually, we do this. We do this in relationships a lot. I've if you're in a relationship with a significant other, and you're being accused of doing something wrong. You, uh, I'm guilty. I, I, off, I have deflected that by going, yeah, but you do this, rather than going, oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, I do do that or something. You know, uh, yeah. you, you kind of deflect it away from you, I guess. Uh, well, and it, hmm. That's good. So I'm just looking at this. So you can. This is going to be a good game. We'll have to play this game when we're not on. Um, we're not on the podcast because that could also is a bit of parody. So in a relationship, for instance, I don't know. We'll use an example. There's definitely another. So you you might be eating a meal, 
and you you spill something on your shirt, you know, you're clumsy. Mm -hmm. So that that's so then they, they then say, oh, look at you, you're a clumsy fool. And then if your partner um, speaks too loudly, you'd parody them. So you, to reflect to it, you go, yo, that, that, so I, I'm clumsy, am I? Oh, yeah, well, at least I don't talk at 25 decibels all the time. <laughs> and then you, you don't only make the argument, you imitate them as well. Yes. I'm just trying to kick, get a few more in there. So parody is something you can use. Yes. You imitate something or somebody comically, which you see in politicians do that so often. Mm -hmm. um, I saw one there that was a really good one. That was in so. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Oh, one, so one that you've okay. Here's one that I'd like to use because you've used this a lot. I've heard you say this, and I've never really known what you're talking about. <laughs> As usual, you have said ad hominem. Yes, you say that quite a lot. Because I yeah, go on. No, that's well, it. We, yeah, so let's talk we, about we, that we, one. Um, we, well, we've spoken about it because again, this. Ad hominem is where you don't argue the case or talk about the, the person or the context. Sorry, where you talk about the person who's giving the argument rather than the argument. Mm -hmm. For instance, if, if somebody is five foot three and they're arguing with me, I go, okay, then. Yeah, maybe I did drive in the back of your car, but at least I'm not short. <laughs> now, it, do, it doesn't make any sense, but it still adds power to the, to the person. Yeah. Um, there, there's a lot of arguments add, um, argument add, obs, argument add absurdum. That's where you take the same. Somebody says, um, they're doing something driving, you know, you, you, you drive too fast. So what does it, what does a person do? They put their foot down and drive really, you know, they're, they're doing 30 and you say you drive too fast. They go to 40 or 50. That is actually a physical, practical argument ad certain. You take the argument, you take it to extreme lengths. In fact, this is a way of um, proving, so I say climate, you know, climate change. People say, you know, the, the global warming is happening. And someone will say, well, it's, it was flipping freezing last night in Birmingham. <laughs> this, this global warming is not, not really happening, is it? Well, it's an absurd, that's an absurd argument, but it still has a weight to it. If global warming, you know, if global warming was that dangerous, how come I keep still have to put the heater on at night? Yes. Yeah. So that's absurdity. You ex you exaggerate the point beyond belief, but it, 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 but it, the, the point you're making is I don't believe in global warming, mm -hmm. but your argument is absurd, but it's still valid because the unconscious mind cannot distinguish truth from fact. It works on emotion. Yes. Fascinating, yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, it's... oh, man, come on, pick one of them. Pick, pick one, pick um, one. Okay, let me have a look. Um, barbarism. Barbarism? That's, is that... Is that... That's like, um, butchering. Have you ever heard the term called, but you're butchering the language? Yes. Yes, definitely. Yeah. So barbarism is where you deliberately butcher the language right. to make a point. Right. Especially if, um, it, perhaps in England, well, I suppose anyway, everywhere, everywhere we've got colloquial terms in, in Holland. I suppose you've got the uh, different dialects around Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, in Birmingham, we have five boroughs around Birmingham, Wolverhampton, Dudley, and et cetera. So what they do in, um, in, in if, you're, if you're from Dudley and you go to business meeting in Birmingham, they might say, you, you am not funny. Mm. You know, someone might say something, you, are, you am not funny, because in, in Dudley, they, 
or in, it's called Am Yam Land. Oh, or yeah. Yam Yam Land. Yeah, yeah. So, that, so it's broken English, but they're doing it deliberately. Right. So barbarism is when you deliberately use your own thing. In fact, I've done it. I, in fact, I do it. Sometimes I'll be giving a speech and I'll go, um, as my mother used to say, one, one cork or fill basket, which means <laughs> a little bit at a time does it. So it's barbarism. So it's where you use your barbaric, your natural, your, because the, the barbarians were the non civilized people, weren't they? Mm. So use an un, so barbarism is to use an uncivilized word to make a either because somebody is a barbarian, so you use their language for them, mm -hmm. or they make an error. So say some, somebody speaks out of turn, makes an error. You don't say to them they've made an error, but you deliberately do one yourself, and that highlights their error. Yes. It's complicated stuff, this. I can see why is, we don't do it. It is, yeah. And, so and there's so much of it to get your head around. And so tell us... So let's say I'm preparing a speech or I'm writing a story, it doesn't matter, and I'm going, right, let's have a look. What rhetoric can I include in this? How would you even – now I've seen the list and it's so big. <laughs> where do you even start? I mean, are you well, going to well, write something and then check it or are you going to check the list and go, oh, how can I use this? I mean, this is where I'm like, my brain's kind of struggling here. Right, so I, I, I like um, three. You know that three is my number. So if there's anything more than three, I'm, I'm lost. Mm -hmm. So I like to chunk things down. Yeah. So we have in my, the rhetorical, my, my rhetorical methodology, <laughs> I say that three times fast. <laughs> My rhetorical methodology is three. So there are three branches, big branches. They are gravitas, levit. We were saying English, gravi gravity, levity, and brevity. Right. So gravity is rhetorical devices that emphasize the seriousness. So the authority, you know, authority stuff, serious. So wh where do I want to use devices that demonstrate my authority, my gravity, you know, my seriousness. Mm -hmm. So so that's one group of rhetorical devices. Then you have levity, which is humor. So which rhetorical device can I use that create fun? Jokes. But we don't tell jokes, remember, we just say things that by um emphasis, contradiction, can be could be seen as funny, yes. But as Winston Churchill's ones are always the same. Like Winston Churchill's got one. It says, "When you're going through hell, keep going." <laughs> yeah. So that's quite humorous. Because again, it, when you think about it, you don't want to get stuck in hell, do you? No. So if you're in hell, if you in find something in hell, keep. If you're going through hell, keep going because that's you're going through. You're going to get out. Mm. So that's kind of the, that's the one. And then the other one is brevity. Any speech, no, so a short speech, try again. Any speech that is short is not all bad. Because you've got one thing going for it, it's short. Mm. So there are three groups. So, so we'll, and then you can also find by Googling the main rhetorical devices, and they are alliteration, which is every around the rugged rocks, the ragged rascal ran, mm -hmm. alliteration. There's illusion where you you hint at what you're saying, which could be seen as a, um, not a metaphor, what's, it, what's it? Uh, a simile. Illusion is a bit like that, so I allude to it. You know? Right, right, yeah. Um, anaphora, what's anaphora in our list? That's in the common one. A succession of sentences beginning with the same word or group of words. So what, give me an example of anaphora, because you use it all the time. You used it on the last podcast quite a few times. Because um... <laughs> what it is, I'm being naughty here, because it's the, the anaphora literally means I repeat. 
And it's a very common rhetorical device. Right. When I first came to England, I couldn't speak a word of it. When I first came to England, they looked at me as if I was a foreigner. When I first came to England, the food upset my stomach. When I first came to England, the, the, the traffic drove on the wrong side of the road. When I first came to England, everything. But now that I understand these people, I've grown to love them. <laughs> <laughs> so anaphora, it's I repeat. Right. It literally means repeat the same phrase at the beginning of every sentence. Ah, right. Okay. Yeah, get it. So again, that's one that we, it sounds like a posh word, anaphora, but now you know it means I repeat. You just say in this part of my speech, I'm going to um, just say the same thing at the front of it. We yeah, and all I, the time. I've done this in my, do you remember yeah. when I've rewritten my kind of, 60 second oh introduction. Gosh, speech. Hey, my signature speech. I keep repeating yeah. the same thing at the beginning over and over. Yeah. So I use okay. it, but I don't know the name for it. But now I do. <laughs> <laughs> and the beauty is, as you said, you can now choose when to use it or when not to use it. Mm. So you can add it in just, just for fun, just because you know it's, and it's quite powerful because the brain likes that repetition. Yeah. It loves it. Yeah. Right, another test one for you. Antithesis. That's one that you use. What sounds rude? Oh, that was that mean? It sounds like no idea. <laughs> I, I need to look at it. Antithesis. Antithesis. So the antithetical. Look it up. Look I'm up looking it up. So antithesis, Greek and for then give setting. Me where you might have used it. Button. Okay. And I, I know that, you, again, it's, you've used it. Greek for setting opposite against placing. It's used in writing or speech either as a proposition that contrasts with or reverses some previously mentioned proposition or when two opposites. Well, perhaps Google that. It, it's something that every story, in fact, it's, it's the whole point yeah. it's the bit where the butler did it at the end kind of thing. Mm, mm. It's, you know, most stories rely on antithesis to... Mm. to to shock the audience. An antithesis, antithesis must always contain two ideas within one statement. Mm. Yeah, I use that in my signature speech too. I have. Okay, give you that example. Say that again. I've used antithesis, antithesis must always contain two ideas within one statement. For an, for example, <laughs> right. So, what in my signature speech I say? The thing that I keep repeating is, um, not everyone wants to be a storyteller. Brilliant. And then I go, not everyone, not everyone, but someone. <laughs> right. Yeah. Not everyone, but someone. But someone. So the thesis, your proposal. Your idea, that's the thesis. My thesis is yes. that everyone, what was, what was the first bit? Not everyone wants to be a storyteller. If that's your thesis. Yeah. But the point you're making is the antithesis. Okay, got it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Light bulb's gone on. Okay, love yeah. it. Yeah. So you, you, you hammer the thesis so that everybody's holding on to the thesis. So that's what every story is at the end. It's called the twist at the end of the story. Right. So the story is based on the thesis. It could be good girls don't do bad things, you know. So I'm a good girl, I'm a good girl, I'm a good girl, I'm a good girl. And then she runs off with the butcher's daughter, son, you know. <laughs> that's a, it's a twist, a flip. You say love is an ideal thing. Love is the best thing in the world. Love is, you know, love is, is fantastic, but marriage is real. <laughs> yeah? Mm. Mm. One small step for man. So, you know, uh, uh, taking a step of 12 inches is nothing. But if you do it on the moon, it's one giant leap for mankind. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Everybody hears my message. Very few people listen. Yes. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. So it's these are starting things. to make sense. Starting to make sense. 
I hope it is so, for the listeners as well, the kind of working this through <laughs> with me. We'll do a couple more because there may be headaches going in there. Um, these are the common ones. Hyperbole. You definitely know what hyperbole is. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> yeah, I do. It's like exaggeration, isn't it? Um, yeah, but, but you, you, you do the most hyperbole of anybody I know on the planet. You do the most hyperbole ever. Yeah, that's a hyperbole in itself. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And the best way, well, a, a way that I look at use hyperbole is obviously statistics. Mm. You know? Yes. Because just like, did you know that Birmingham is the youngest city in Europe? It's a city of a million people, and there are 400,000 people under the age of 35. Mm. That's actually a hyperbolic argument. Yeah. Because it's big numbers. And there was an advert uh, a few years ago that was shown during the. Um, oh, it's what's it called? The one of the big either um, uh, World Series final. What what is it called? The something Super bowl. bowl. Super Bowl. Super Bowl. Yeah, um, where. This advert that was shown was a woman giving birth to a baby and the husband's eating some, I won't say the brand, but he was eating um, some corn chips or whatever, crisps. Um, but he was waving it over the tummy and uh, the baby moved every time he waved it over the tummy. <laughs> I remember, I remember. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then... He was teasing the baby and then the baby shot out <laughs> to grab the bag of, of, of snacks, the crisps um, or chips or whatever they're called. And um, yeah, so that was like a hyper bowl. It was so exaggerated, but because it was so exaggerated, it's memorable um, that they're so oh, good that even the baby comes out because he wants it or she wants it. it. Yeah. There's, I mean, how many rhetorical devices are in there? So you've got hyperbole, you've got exaggeration, which is which is similar to hyperbole and exaggeration. Then you've got the humour mm. of it. So remember it when he when he when he's kind of teasing the baby. That's right. And so there's a, adverts again. Another great place if you wanted to study rhetoric because they try and pack as many devices in. Mm. Mm. Um, what was I going to say? So in, with the, also, we just did antithesis. Let's, if we wrap an antithesis and the hyperbole together, you can get something like this. So um, somebody's, in, in, in the story, um, the guy's been out there and then tarts from. So somebody's freezing cold, lost, he's naked in the cold, but he's angry because he's been left out naked and cold. Mm. So the, the hyperbole and the antithesis, I'm kind of making this up, so I'm forcing a bit, but you, you could say his body was as white as snow, his face burned like fire. Mm. So he was cold and angry. His body was as white as snow, his face burned like fire. Yeah. So the hyperbole is you exaggerating, his body was as white as snow, that's unlikely. Yeah. And the other hyperbole is his face burned like fire. It's unlikely that his head's on fire. Right, right, right. You've also got, you've also got the juxtaposition of mm. snow and ice in the same person. Yeah. So I've... So you've got the anti... Huh? No, carry on. Yeah, the antithesis. So, so, the, the, so the, the thesis is he's cold, he's freezing cold. That's mm. the thesis. Mm. The antithesis is, but his face is on fire. Right. Yeah. But you've done it using two exaggerations. You've got two examples of hyperbole and the antithesis flicked in there. I, it's interesting, actually, because, again, I can see where I've used this in my animations because I did an animation for myself, for my own business, right? And I tell the story about a creative designer who's trying to come up with a campaign for a client. And I say that he has his first thing that he does, he has an espresso because it helps him think clearly and it allows his brain to free wheel all over the place, right? Wow. And then on screen, 
I bring up, whilst that word's being said, I bring up a brain that's cycling and I've got an animation where he's cycling, a, a brain cycling on a unicycle, right? And no one's ever seen a brain on a unicycle <laughs> before in their lives. And it's to kind of plant that in people's heads. So it's like a hyperbole exaggeration of a brain on a unicycle and his brain is freewheeling all over the place. That's why, because if you're on a unicycle, you haven't really got any control where you're going that much, you know, you're freewheeling because uh, there's no brakes on a unicycle either. But I never knew that's what I was doing, if you know what I mean. It just, I guess, it came natural to me. Well, we, we, we didn't know the label. You knew what you were doing. No, but I didn't know the label. Really? You're right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, so what's what's the use of labels then? Because just in closing, you don't need to know all this this stuff. It, you could say, "Why do I need to do it?" Mm. And you're doing it anyway. So why 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 bother going through this huge list if I'm doing it anyway? So that's kind of a rhetorical question, by the way. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. God, I don't so know. Me, what, I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> you know what the answer is. Well, that's quite ironic. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it is, okay. yeah. So the point is, there are so many of them. We do, we tend to do what we do. We're creatures of habit. Mm. Jargon is a hyperbole. Is, is, is a, you know, about using jargon, highly technical language, specific language. So we get caught up in our own jargon. Mm. And therefore, it limits our creativity. So if we learn all these things, just playing with this, it gives you, gives you some things, tools you can do. Um, a maxim, a stitch in time saves nine. Duh, duh, duh. So what we try and do is, I try and do is, I have a maxim, I've created a maxim for what I do. So I say, I'm affectionately known as the signature speech coach. That's a maxim. It's a saying that I want to do. So when we get some motto or Stephen Colbert, his maxim when he starts off is, hi, my name is Stephen Colbert. I'm the your host for this evening. So we create these, these things. Now, if I hadn't used that before, the idea of finishing off the same way or starting the same way or having a, a saying that's associated with me, a catchphrase. Yeah. So a catchphrase is a maxim. Right. So if I wasn't using those things, there's mesodiplosis. So that's the that's a, the that's putting your um, repeat word in the middle, because meso means middle, diplosis means like a loud sound. So you can actually do it's quite common. But you put in the middle, so you'll say, I, I won't give you an example, but we'll, but these are just things that you can. You can, I'm speaking about it. Metonymy, we haven't mentioned metonymy. So shall we, so I'll let you close on what a metonymy okay. is. Okay. May not, may not use. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, so metonymy is one that I learned a couple of years ago. I'd never come across before. It's a type of metaphor. And it's, the, the best way for me to explain it is, it allows you to remember the type of metaphor more clearly because you've got to work harder in trying to understand what's being said, right? So it forces the brain to think harder. Therefore, it will create new neurons in the brain to, to, for you to remember. So an example would be the gray suits left the boardroom, right? Well, gray suits, it's not a, they're not people, but we all know what it means. You know, we, we all have a sense of what it could be. Um, a lot of us so are lawyers. So Grey suits are normally lawyers or businessmen. Yeah, businessmen, lawyers, boring people. <laughs> be <laughs> because that's, you know, people in grey suits are usually boring because they're wearing grey or, you know, they're not very interesting. They're no, there's no colour with them at all. There's no interest there. Um. We often get it now with with Trump, you know, when people, they don't mention him, but they may say the White House has decided. Well, 
the White House is a building, you know, the building can't decide, but we all know where it is, who lives in there, who probably has made the decision, which is Donald Trump. But they cloak it with saying it's the White House who's decided it. So it's it's a collective of people, not just Donald Trump. But it probably is just and Donald Trump. <laughs> but and why when, when autonomy is re I say autonomy is really useful is when you don't want to become cheesy in your speech. Mm. So if you, if you mention a, a character, Donald Trump did this, Donald Trump did that, Donald Trump did the other. So you can use metonymies to, instead of saying, Donald Trump is the 45th president of the United States, he did this, the ginger, the, the orange-faced politician did that. So metonymy is another way to repeat the same noun without repeating the same noun right yeah yeah so it's not, so like like you said the white house issued a statement mm. and then the government thinks this and politicians think that mm. so you can use it to do that so i mean we we don't want to we could go on forever in yeah this, we could yeah yeah my takeaway from this before i let you close is that just diving into this list just googling um, rhetorical techniques will help you if you ever get uh, writer's block or you're worried about how to make your speech interesting. There are literally hundreds of ways you can make your speech more persuasive by adding the techniques of rhetoric to your talk. Brilliant. Thank you. I have to say this was quite challenging for me. <laughs> But I've also learned a huge amount. So thank you very much for bringing this topic up. It's quite appropriate as we're going on our journey, looking at different speeches and stories in this podcast series that we took time out to look at this because a lot of this, as you mentioned in the previous podcast or referring to the previous one, a lot of these are being used in some of the speeches that we've been uh, examining together. So thank you very much, Michael Don. Um, it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from me. Thank you, Michael D. Jeans.